today we'll be talking about uh, Confederate Lieutenant General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, he was admired by his friends and foes alike. In fact, uh, General William T. Sherman uh, said that he was the most interesting man uh, our American Civil War produced on either side. He never read a uh, military textbook in his life. He knew nothing about tactics, Sherman remarked, and yet uh, he couldn't even drill a company. But uh, he had a grasp of strategy that was a, a genius and, to me, incomprehensible. Robert E. Lee would have agreed. Uh, he was asked in a newspaper interview after the war who was the best general in the American Civil War. And his answer was, it's a man I've never met. His name is Forrest. In fact, the two of them never did meet. Pierre Beauregard, whose favorite general was himself, said that uh, Forrest's genius for war was only limited by the opportunity for its display. Uh, Joseph E. Johnston, the commander of the, Conf of the Confederate Western Front, said uh, Forrest, uh, had he had the advantage of uh, proper military education and training, he would have been the great central figure of the war because of his genius. Uh, Shelby uh, Foote remarked, the Civil War produced two authentic military geniuses, Abraham Lincoln and uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, and the praise went on. He was studied by people like Marshal Foch, uh, the French Field Marshal in World War I, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces. Uh, he was studied by Field Marshal Lord Wollersley, the commander of the army under Queen Victoria in the British Empire. He was studied by uh, Wavell, the uh, British Field Marshal who was Commander-in-Chief in North Africa and later in India. Uh, he was studied by uh, Field Marshal Irvin Rommel, the famed Desert Fox from World War II. And even people like Ulysses S. Grant spoke very highly of Forrest. He said that uh, Forrest, for the kind of warfare he was called upon to conduct, neither side could produce a better officer than he was. In fact, uh, Catawalter Washburn, his, uh, who served with him for three years, uh, said that Forrest was the only Confederate raider in whom Forrest stood in much dread. He said if anyone else was in his rear, uh, he uh, basically blew it off, to use a modern term. But if the Confederate commander was Forrest, he immediately became apprehensive because Forrest didn't conform to any known military protocols. He was a law unto himself for all military actions and constantly did the unexpected at all times and places. Um, Sherman once said that uh, he, Forrest had to be killed. He didn't care if it cost 10,000 lives and bankrupted the Treasury because they would never have peace in western Tennessee until Forrest was dead. And this was one of the few military objectives that General Sherman set for himself that he never accomplished. Uh, another Union general said, uh, we never know where Forrest is or what he plans to do, but he always knows where we are and what we propose to do. Um, general Sherman uh, had reason to fear General Forrest. Not only did he destroy uh, Sherman's wagon trains and blow up his railroad bridges, uh, he burned his supply depots, blew up his uh, ammunition dumps, uh, rustled hundreds of heads of cattle, stole thousands of his horses, captured a hundred of his guns, uh, inflicted 31,000 casualties on the Yankees when he never rarely commanded more than 3,000 men. Uh, then he would simply disappear to repeat the whole process all over again later. Uh, he almost killed General Sherman personally. Uh, this occurred at uh, the Battle of Fallen Timbers, April 8, 1862, right after the Battle of Shiloh. The Confederate Army was, uh, had been defeated and was retreating smartly. And uh, Sherman was in pursuit uh, his cavalry and uh, infantry became separated, but he didn't particularly worry about it because the uh, southern infantry was retreating like it was supposed to. Uh, he did not realize that Forrest was lurking off his flank waiting for him to make a mistake. And when he uh, got his infantry separated by, as it crossed a small stream, 
uh, Forrest attacked, and uh, Sherman uh, later told a, a reunion of Army of Tennessee veterans, uh, down with a whoop came Forrest and his entire command, hundreds of Confederates, firing right and left with their pistols and screaming their rebel yells. He broke through our uh, lines, over, ran over our supports, and was soon among me and my staff. Uh, as Captain McCoy, his aide, was knocked down in the mud, horse and rider, and uh, Forrest and Sherman came within a few feet of each other. And uh, Forrest, uh, Sherman later told his veterans, had Forrest not emptied his uh, pistol as he broke through our lines, my career would have ended then and there. The two did not meet again until after the war, but uh, uh, Forrest inflicted torment on Sherman uh, every uh, waking day. And Sherman later admitted to General Forrest that he had nightmares about Forrest. They, they met one time, it was aboard a steamboat, they just ran into each other and they uh, went over to a table to talk and uh, unfortunately uh, it was not transcribed. But uh, Forrest told Sherman that uh, uh, he'd been given his way had Jefferson Davis released him. He would have fallen on Sherman's supply lines and Forrest would have made Sherman's nightmares come true. Sherman at the time was supplying 130,000 men and 35,000 horses and mules over one railroad. It was 400 miles long. It was vulnerable to Forrest and Forrest knew it, and, but he could not get the Confederate High Command to give him permission to um, attack it. Famed historian Dr. Lowell Johnson later said this was the worst mistake Jefferson Davis made in the whole war. And uh, Davis himself later admitted, he said uh, he thought Forrest was a good raider, but he had been misled by his military advisors. And he said, I saw it all after it was too late. Uh, I should mention that Forrest had a genius for destruction, especially of railroads that no other Civil War commander had. Uh, most of them uh, heated the rails in the middle and uh, of course, that meant they had to rip them up first and then tie them around the trees, and it made a good photograph. Uh, but it, took, it was very time consuming, took a lot of work and a lot of effort. Uh, what Forrest would do is uh, he would simply put small rails, uh, small fires on the rails, and uh, it would cause the rails to buckle. It uh, might not be but three or four inches, but uh, that was enough where a train couldn't operate on it. So to fix a railroad destroyed by Forrest, the Yankees first had to rip up their own rails, then bring in new rails and put them down. And to add insult to injury, the wood Forrest used which to warp the rails was Union cordwood. They had cut it and put it in huge mountains to supply their locomotives. Um, a railroad uh, Forrest uh, uh, destroyed took months to repair, not weeks. In fact, uh, he uh, made a raid in western uh, Tennessee in uh, 1862, and he did so much damage to the rail system that General Grant abandoned it altogether, and it wasn't used again until after the war. All of this is pretty remarkable, considering uh, the man we're talking about was a first grade dropout. He went two, three month sessions to school, and that's, uh, that's all he attended. He never did learn how to read and write properly. He said he never saw a pen, but what he didn't think of a snake. Yet as a first grade dropout, he grew up in poverty. Um, they, he stayed in a, a one room log cabin with his family, and there were 10 of them, and it was 960 square feet. And you could uh, look through the holes and the logs and see outside. Uh, all three of his sisters died of disease, and that was a major contributing factor. That included his twin sister, Fanny. Uh, yet, by the time the Civil War started, he estimated his wealth at being $1.5 million. That's uh, $34 million in today's money. But I've seen some of the accounts uh, that he had, and he was lowballing it. He was worth more than that. Uh, he uh, owned a brick manufacturing plant, he set up a, a stagecoach, he had a mail route, 
Uh, he uh, traded slaves. Uh, he was a big land speculator. He also planted cotton. Um, so he was a very wealthy man when the war started, which gave him a major advantage. He enlisted in the Confederate Army as a private. He was the one man in the Confederate Army who rose from the rank of private to lieutenant general in four years. In the process, he won incredible victories. The Battle of Lawrence Plantation, for example, he was outnumbered four to one. No Yankees escaped. At Oklahoma, the Yankees uh, had their Green Beret of their cavalry. They picked uh, through every unit on the Western Front, got the best cavalrymen, got the best horses, Armed them all with sharks, carbines, the best rifle uh, of that day for cavalry. Uh, gave them double sets of horseshoes, and the only uh, wheel vehicles they had were 20 cannons and, uh, uh, and amb ambulances. Forrest met these uh, 7,000 men with uh, 2,500 men, but 600 of his men were unarmed. Uh, Forrest uh, told them, uh, get in line anyway. You can't shoot, but you can yell. Um, and don't worry about it, you will have your pick of good Yankee weapons shortly. <clears throat> and he did. He defeated them, he ran them 11 miles, he captured every cannon they had, and every ambulance, um, and thoroughly defeated the Yankees. They were totally routed, and uh, at the end of the battle, all his men were well armed with Sharps carbines. At Bright's Crossroads, uh, Forrest had 3,200 men. Uh, the Yankees had 13,000 men, and he crushed them. Uh, and this happened again and again and again. Uh, every Yankee commander until the last week of the war who was sent to uh, defeat Forrest was himself crushed. And in one occasion, uh, one of them rode out into no man's land with a sword drawn to take on uh, the Confederate champion one-on-one. -on -one. Forrest answered, uh, and they had a sword duel just like out of something from the Middle Ages. It ended with Forrest running his sword all the way through the Union commander. Um, General Washburn, who was no dummy, uh, operated against him, uh, as did General Herbert and uh, Sturgis and Suey Smith and others, and he defeated all in turn. Um, matter of fact, General Washburn ended up uh, uh, running down the streets of Memphis in his nightshirt because Forrest had broken into his hotel in Memphis. Forrest was supposed to be 80 miles to the south at the time. Uh, General Herbert, who had been uh, replaced, uh, said, uh, they fired me because I couldn't keep Forrest out of West Tennessee. General Herbert couldn't keep him out of his bedroom. An alley in the Mississippi is called uh, Washburn's Alley, uh, even today, because that's where he made his famous run. And it was one thing after another like this for the whole war. Uh, as I said, he personally killed 30 Yankees in one-on-one -on -one combat. Uh, he also killed a gunfighter. Uh, before the war, uh, he, uh, four gunfighters came to kill his uncle. Forrest met him on uh, Main Street by himself and said, uh, your affair with my uncle is your own business, but I will not allow you, uh, four of you to murder him. And they drew up down on him. Forrest killed one, he crippled another. Uh, he seriously wounded a third, and the fourth ran away, and Forrest chased him down. Uh, he didn't kill him, he put the knife to his throat and said, uh, your life is in my hands, but I'm too uh, much a man to uh, kill someone so totally in my power. I always remember that I let you live. Uh, this incident was doubly remarkable because Forrest was only armed with a two-shot pistol. Uh, fortunately for him, a friend tossed him a bullet knife, and that's how he uh, got the third one. Uh, he was a uh, contradiction in many ways. He uh, wouldn't drink, but uh, he would curse. He had no regard whatsoever for the Third Commandment. Uh, uh, General Patton didn't have anything on him when it came to profanity, but uh, he had a profound respect for women. 
He would not allow dirty jokes to be told in their presence. He uh, had greatest respect for his wife. He never cheated. Uh, in fact, once he fired one of his best friends. He said, I will not have in my army anyone who would do that to a woman because he'd had sex outside of marriage with her. Um, his biggest vice was gambling. Uh, the man was a natural gambler. He showed that on many battlefields, but also many poker games. On uh, three occasions I can document, he won modern equivalent of $50,000 in a single night. Once it was $100,000. And this caused a little stress in his marriage because uh, Mary was a devout Christian girl. Uh, she didn't go for that at all. In fact, uh, he, uh, he signed a note for somebody for $2,500. It's about $50,000 today. The man defaulted. Uh, this was after the war. Forrest had $10 and he couldn't meet the note, but it fell to him. So he said, uh, I'm going out to win the money playing poker and ask his wife to pray for him. And she said, I most certainly will not. I will be on my knees with my Bible in my hand the whole time you're gone playing for your eternal conviction. And uh, after he won $2,500 with $10 stakes, he started packing up his money. And the other gamblers, of course, wanted him to stay and finish so they could have a chance to win their money back. He said, no, I have a woman at home praying for me and uh, I'm going back to sit with her and I will never gamble again. And he never did. Um, he had a hard time winning her anyway. Uh, he he uh, met her and uh, proposed the third time he saw her. Uh, she accepted on the fourth, but the problem was uh, her guardian, her daddy was dead. Uh, his name was Reverend Cowan. And he was not at all excited about having uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest in his family. Uh, so they argued about it, basically, and finally the uh, reverend said, uh, why do you want to marry her? She is a sweet, nice, introverted, well-educated uh, Christian girl. She never swears, but you do, uh, and you gamble, and you uh, have gunfights, and uh, you're extroverted, and you're not a Christian, and she is. Why do you want to marry her? She's nothing like you. To which Forrest responded, I don't want to marry anybody like me. I want to marry a Christian girl. It's kind of parallel in my own life there. And uh, it worked out fine. She eventually did get him baptized. He did eventually, after the Civil War, convert to Christianity. But it was a long, hard ride for Mrs. Forrest. Um, Forrest uh, went through any number of incidents in the Civil War. He uh, had a uh, interesting horse. I think his horse was uh, a great story in itself. He, he, he rode, uh, he had 29 horses shot out from under him in the war. 18 of them were killed. But the one that survived was named King Philip. Uh, Philip was wounded a couple of times. But um, it was a lethargic horse in camp, but it came alive on the battlefield. Uh, King Philip became another uh, combatant. Uh, they say horses are colorblind, but this one could definitely tell the difference between blue and gray, or butternut. Uh, he was famous for stepping on Yankees, stomping them, uh, and uh, liked to bite huge amounts of flesh out of them, even after the battle was over. Uh, he and Forrest uh, had a disagreement. During the war, Forrest looked upon Yankees with distaste. King Philip loved the taste of Yankees. In fact, uh, after the war, uh, Forrest brought him home. He was the only horse that survived and uh, took his saddle off and uh, said, no saddle will ever again touch his back. But that didn't mean Mary uh, wouldn't uh, subject him to the indignity of being a carriage horse. So she and uh, uh, two or three of her friends um, uh, hitched him up and they went out to Memphis one day for a, you know, a nice day of shopping, had a pleasant time together. And they were talking and going down the street uh, when King Philip looked down the sidewalk and saw a company 
of Memphis uh, police recruits forming up. Now the war was over, and these were not Yankees, but they were wearing blue uniforms. And this is all King Philip needed. Uh, he, uh, his ears went back, his head went up, he snorted with hate, and he took off down the sidewalk uh, to attack the police. And uh, gentlemen were grabbing their ladies, packages were flying everywhere, uh, people were ducking into alleys. Uh, the cops saw him coming and there were policemen running in every direction. Uh, the women were uh, screaming and they were trying to restrain the horse, but they couldn't check out fully grown war horse like King Philip. Uh, and before it was over, all the policemen were gone. They had run away. Uh, and uh, there was nothing there in the old assembly area except a carriage with four screaming women and King Philip, who was very proud of himself. Uh, he was, uh, he saved Forrest's life on more than one occasion, so I guess he could get away with it. Forrest, um, ran away on one occasion. Uh, he was not completely fearless. It happened in uh, late 1864. Um, it was raining and the uh, muddy roads of uh, Tennessee had turned into quagmires, basically bottomless. And what Forrest liked to do was destroy main uh, trestles of railroads. Well, the Yankees uh, started putting stockades up so that uh, Forrest couldn't do that unless he brought up artillery. So Forrest started carrying artillery on his raids. And on this particular day, uh, one of his guns had sunk down to the axle and they couldn't get it open. And Forrest was in a bad mood anyway. Well, just before Forrest arrived, Lieutenant Andrew McGregor showed up. And uh, he, uh, uh, took charge and told the men to empty the ammunition chest, and they did. And uh, they were still unable to get it uh, out of the mud when Forrest showed up. And he said, who has charge here? And McGregor says, I do, sir. And Forrest said uh, words we cannot repeat here. He gave uh, McGregor a fierce cursing. And uh, McGregor took it until Forrest ran out of breath, and then he said, Commanding officer, no, no one talks to me that way and lives. So he opened up the ammunition test and threw his torch in it and slammed it down. Now, from where Forrest was sitting on his horse, he could not see the ammunition chest was empty. He expected an explosion any moment. And no doubt his eyes got wide and his mouth dropped open and he turned and, and took off like a rabbit shot at twice. And he went to his staff and told his chief of staff, Captain uh, Anderson, a dangerous lunatic who has just escaped from the asylum is trying to blow up me and my ammunition supply. Uh, go arrest Captain McGregor. Well, <clears throat> uh, Anderson did as he was told, and McGregor told him what had really happened, and Anderson came back laughing, and uh, he told Forrest and the staff uh, what had really happened. And they all laughed, and Forrest also pretended he thought it was funny. But everybody noticed from then on in, there were two people around whom Forrest was careful not to curse, Mary Ann and uh, Captain Andrew McGregor. <clears throat> now, after the war, uh, Forrest uh, uh, did become involved in the Ku Klux Klan. That has to be addressed. Uh, it was not the same Klan as we have today. Uh, but uh, after the Civil War, not only did the Confederacy collapse, the entire Southern economy had, and law and order at the local level in many places had ceased to exist. And on Christmas Eve, uh, 1865, six Confederate veterans got together in the uh, chambers of Judge uh, Thomas Jones in Pulaski, Tennessee, and uh, said, let's form a club. And they formed a club they called the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, four of these men were former officers, three of them were lawyers. It uh, wasn't like the white trash organization, the quasi-terrorist group you have today. Uh, they immediately said that uh, they would not recruit people. People had to volunteer to join the Klan. They had to apply. And then they immediately violated their first principle. They went out and recruited uh, 
Dr. Grant, a distinguished and highly thought of surgeon in the area. And as far as we can tell, the eighth member of the Ku Klux Klan was uh, Major General uh, John C. Brown, who within eight years would be governor of uh, Tennessee. Uh, so it was a much higher caliber people. What, what people today don't realize is that the organizations change over time. Uh, a good example is the Democratic Party. In 1865, the year the Klan was formed, the Democratic Party transitioned from the party of slavery to the party of white supremacy. And later it became the party of uh, segregation and only much later did it evolve into whatever it is today. And I think it's, uh, I think it's redefining itself again even as we speak. Well, the Klan was the same way. Um, uh, General Forrest got involved in 1866 and he had two purposes. Uh, first of all, there was a lot of uh, anarchy in the countryside. You had uh, uh, newly freed slaves who didn't know how to handle their freedom. Uh, you had uh, Union deserters, Confederate deserters, outlaws, thugs. Uh, Forrest was getting a hundred letters a day from former members of his command talking about the deprivations of the criminals in the rural areas. And uh, Forrest wanted to put an end to that. And also, and this sounds incredible today, but some of the northern leaders wanted a second civil war, uh, including Thaddeus Stevens, the head of the Powerful Ways and Means Committee, and uh, also uh, Governor Brownlow of uh, Tennessee. Uh, he wanted, quote, a war of extermination against anyone who was a former Confederate. He actually introduced a bill in the legislature, or rather had it introduced, uh, making it legal to shoot a former Confederate on site uh, without any legal penalties. And uh, Forrest had to take that kind of wild talk seriously. So uh, he uh, accepted the post of Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Forrest, uh, when he was Grand Wizard, wanted to create a paramilitary force in case the Northerners did start a second civil war. In fact, he testified to Congress that he could uh, call up 50,000 men today and would have a cavalry army of another half a million men within five days if he needed them. And nobody uh, wanted to fight a uh, cavalry army of a half a million men led by Nathan Bedford Forrest. So the uh, attempt to make shooting Confederates in Tennessee a legal act uh, died a morning and uh, Brownlow resigned as governor in January 1869. That same month, Nathan Bedford Forrest ordered the Ku Klux Klan disbanded. He saw what it was becoming. Uh, its high ideals in 1866 uh, were being eradicated by white trash elements that were taking it over. He ordered the uh, leader of each group to burn the costumes and uh, go home and not to reassemble unless he personally caught them. And that was uh, basically the end of the first Ku Klux Klan. Some of the outlying uh, groups didn't disband but uh, it essentially was a non-factor in America until um, 1915 when the present incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan emerged. Um, but um, Forrest had been dead 39 years by then. Anyway, um, what the Klan is today and what it was when Forrest took it over are two entirely different things. Uh, many people, though, aren't able to see history that way. They look at uh, history from today and impose today's standards on the past. Professional historians call that presentism, uh, which I consider an invalid way to look at history because you don't live your life that way. None of us do. We all live our lives from our present to our future, just as the people of the past live their lives from their present to their future. Um, so uh, to blame uh, Forrest for um, the later lynchings and uh, cross burnings of the Klan is uh, not about a, a 
valid thing to do. Anyway, that uh, concludes our story of uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Do you have any questions?